Anybody can become rich only because becoming rich is a surprisingly straightforward thing. Micaiah Rawson, the man who built a tech business at age 25 and sold it for 110 million. He believes that building wealth is down to a simple formula that anyone can follow. And he's here today to put all the fake gurus to shame. Some of the worst advice you can follow as a young entrepreneur is to follow your passion. If you have six figures, if I'm being brutally honest, like you don't have much money. One of the worst things that happens to you is the adults who gave up on their dreams remind you that you should give up on yours. I was 12 and I started this business that made me $1,000 in a week. Nothing changes if my bank account goes up and down a million bucks. The trick is convincing yourself you have options, you have abundance when you're flat out Broke. Because if you are desperate, no one's going to buy from you. You listen to these interviews with great entrepreneurs. They always say things like, I always knew we were going to make it. That was never me. 98 out of 100 days, I thought we were going bankrupt. Entrepreneurial ventures aren't risky. You go in, you fail, you learn something, you move on. But yeah, I ended up at this happy hour in San Francisco with Bill Gates. Every successful $100 million company or plus has the same three attributes. If I hit a million subscribers in the next 12 months, I will buy myself a private jet. Welcome to the podcast. Pleasure to have you. Pleasure to be here. So there are so many fake gurus on social media selling courses about how to get rich. You know, what makes you different and why should people listen to you? So the, the, the challenge I have with most fake gurus online is some of them are actually quite wealthy, but they got wealthy not by doing what they're telling you to do, but by selling you information, selling you a course, selling you a member mentorship or anything like that. And frankly, this is actually... Probably the main reason I started creating content in the first place was just watching the way that really young men are being led by these gurus just drove me nuts. And so, uh, you know, my personality is not one that is comfortable talking about numbers, comfortable talking about business. But having now built and sold a company for $110 million, I, I just felt like I needed to actually share some real knowledge with these entrepreneurs. Like, I just felt like they're being led astray. And... My story is very public. I built a company called Prodigy, was acquired by a public company, Upstart. Like there's SEC filings, like it's on the NASDAQ. Like it's very legitimate that you can just look at my backstory and see what I've done. Um, and as a result of that, why should you listen to me? Well, I'm not selling you anything. Like I literally have lost tens of thousands of dollars this year just doing content. I have a full-time editor, all the camera gear, everything else. But uh, I just think there's this sort of, there's, the way I think about it is there's two, two sort of circles and I'm in the middle of that. There's people that have done really legitimate things in business and many have done far greater things than me. There's people that are good at creating content. The overlap of those two is like so tiny. So for me, it's almost funny. Like when I talk about selling a company for 110 million, that's a big deal because not many people have done that that are creating stuff online. But like among my friend group, I'm like the failure. Like my friends, one of them IPO'd a company for 2 billion. Another one sold a company for 525 million. They're all younger than me, but they're not talking about it. They're not creating content. So I would say in my social circles, like I'm the poor one, but on YouTube, on Instagram, creating content, I'm one of the few that have actually done it. So, so I suppose the question a lot of people would have is if you've got all this money, why are you creating content? Why bother? We get the message all the time on the Mark Tilbury channel. Like if you're really a millionaire, you wouldn't be on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. I, I used to be that guy. I was so skeptical when I'd see these people talking about money. Um, and I was just like, yeah, why would you waste your time doing this? Why would you want to spend all this time? Just go spend your money. Just go have fun. Um, and it really hit me when I was 31. I sold the company for 110. And I had this, like, this huge list of goals, list of dreams. And I'd achieved all of them. And I was 31. And that's like both the worst, best and worst thing that can happen to you. Because when you achieve all your life dreams at 31, you're like, well, what do I do now? And you can do the whole vacation thing. Like you can sip Mai Tais on the beach, Thailand and all that. I've done all that. Um, and it, at some point you're like, I, I need to do something else. But I didn't want to just make more money. I my, my mindset around money has really changed. When I was young, uh, grew up super poor. Like my mom declared bankruptcy when I was four. And that was just sort of my childhood. Soup kitchens, shelters, all that. And... Growing up, my, my primary question was just, how do I make more money? Because I just, when you're poor, you have money problems and you can just make more money and solve them. And that's like probably one of the most important things you can do. Once you have so much money that you can't solve any problems with money, like everything's just solved for you. I think one of the dumbest things you can do is try to make more money. So I started asking better questions. Like what's gonna make me happy? 
what can I do to fill my time that I can actually enjoy? And that's kind of how I landed on content. I was like, well, I, I don't want to chase this meaningless number in my bank account. At this point, every day, the number goes up and down by a, a shocking amount, given how volatile the markets are. And it literally doesn't affect me. I don't decide, oh, I can't go out to eat today. I can't go on this vacation. It, like nothing changes if my bank account goes up and down a million bucks. But by actually now having a new number that really, I wake up every day and I want to see go up, which is now my subscriber count, my follower count, my views. That number is actually meaningful to me. I see every subscriber as someone who could have their life changed by the content. And like, I'm still a pretty small creator, but I get DMs all the time with people that like, this is so helpful. It's changed my life. So it's, I'm a competitive guy. It's taking that drive, taking that want to, to move a number up and to the right. Like when I was running my startup, uh, but it's not about the money. It's just about like, how do I fill that drive in my life and not worry about the money that comes from it. I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs, once they exit, they sort of chase that purpose. Would yep. you say that that's what it is for you? Yeah, it's, uh, it, I'll, I'll say it's, it's also not a popular opinion amongst my friends because I'm, I'm 33 now. All of my friends who have made far more money than me are like, yeah, but you could do it again and you can make more money. In fact, I've only met one other entrepreneur who, who basically sold a company for a ton of money and retired very young. They all kind of go back into the game and they just want to make more money. But yeah, for me, actually money has gotten to the point where it has no purpose. Like it just doesn't do anything for me anymore. And I think the worst way you can live your life is living without some purpose. So part of it is also uh, maybe just me convincing myself that I'm doing something important by creating content. Uh, but I like to think that, yeah, like this is my new life purpose. And it's one of those things that I had a very specific number that I wanted to make, made that mu made far more than that. So that game's kind of done. I don't have a top number that I want to hit with content or, a, a, you know, if I affect this many lives, I'm done. It's This is something I could do for the next 40 years. So will you monetize this new purpose at some point or are you just against that completely? <sighs> I was fighting with, uh, so I've like, I'm paying a lot of money. Like I have a YouTube coach, $470 an hour. So like, yeah. I'm investing a lot in this stuff. Uh, and he was fighting with me. He's like, you really should sell a course. Like, and I was like, I really don't want to. Um, I'll, th I'll certainly throw an AdSense. Cause like at some point I'm literally just bleeding thousands of dollars every month. And that should probably change. But I don't, I don't, I don't want to make more money than my audience makes from watching me. I'll put it that way. So I've thought about like, could I start a venture fund and literally just write like 500K checks into my followers that are starting awesome businesses? Could I start a venture studio where I have a list of ideas? I'll put in the first million bucks. Let's build a business together. And if I have a million followers, hopefully there's like 10 good CEOs that like follow me and want to do something like that. Things that actually help my audience achieve their goals. And maybe I could make some money along the way there. But yeah, like selling a course, I, I, it's just not interesting to me because I could just make the course for free on YouTube and just give it away and hopefully more people watch it. So I do need to monetize it. I need to stop just bleeding money every month, but it's just not a priority. I guess it'd be good for it because we, we have this discussion a lot. We work with quite a few channels behind the scenes with successful people who made money elsewhere and have now come into this space. And a lot of them say, look, I just want to at least break even so that yeah. this can run itself because it is expensive to build a brand and create content. I think a lot of people watching the content don't realize what necessarily goes into it behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got like $20,000 of camera gear just like yeah. sitting behind me up to my film. So yeah, I think break even is in the next six to 12 months, that'd be a nice place to get to. I'm just not bleeding money every month. Um, but I have no no need or intention to make it profitable. I guess I'll put it that way. When you think of the people that are doing it, maybe for the wrong reasons, let's call yep. them fake gurus. Yeah. Are there any big names that come to mind? <laughs> Spicy question. Uh, and presumably if they're so bad for people, it's it's a good idea to let people know, watch out for this person or do your research on this person. They might not be as they seem. Yeah, this is a tough one. Um, because I want to, I, I genuinely want to give you names. Um, and I just genuinely don't follow these people enough to know like what names would be. Let me think. Hmm. Fake guru. I think a lot of the dropship guys. I don't know their names, but I see, I see them pull up. Dropshipping is probably the biggest realm of fake gurus you'll find on the internet. 
simply because you can actually get to revenue figures drop shipping, but drop shipping usually runs 20 to 30% margins. And you're, you need to actually acquire customers. Amazon's going to take 15%. You've got overhead from running the business. And so you can be doing a million dollars, $10 million a month in sales and your profit could literally be like minimum wage. So I would say the drop shipping and then the like day trading Forex guys. How about the um, the real estate guys? Because that's more of a, an asset class, right? Yeah. That you put your money into after you've made money versus the people that build their their fortunes that selling people the dream that they can become millionaires yeah. through real estate. Yeah, real estate is uh, one of the most frustrating uh, categories of fake gurus because the real estate guys, um, some of them have actually made legitimate money in real estate, but real estate is a cyclical market. Real estate goes up, real estate goes down. They don't know how to do anything else. So like right now is probably the worst time in the last 10 years to be buying real estate. Interest rates are ultra high, but prices haven't come down. But because they don't know anything else, they're saying, go out, buy it. Like deals are still there. You just have to be creative and things like that. And and the real estate guys, if you actually, again, dig into the numbers, they're buying million dollar homes that are cash flowing like a couple hundred bucks a month. They won't show you the full cash flow. They'll just say, you know, this is the appreciation, things like that. Uh, So real estate guys kind of drive me nuts too. Um, But they they drink the Kool-Aid more than any other fake gurus. Because if you go and meet with real estate guys, they only own real estate. Like they're not actually secretly behind the scenes investing in stocks and bonds. Like they're kind of all real estate. Yeah, most of the time they have their, tra- their training company and then they yep. put the money into the actual investments after that. So that's their cash flow business. Yep. So they're not making most of their money through real estate, maybe passively, but actually the active income's coming through the training. It's yeah. so true that if they didn't have the training company, yeah. how would they buy the real estate? That's how they build their, their empire. Yeah. Really. yeah, and then they have like 20 houses at you know the age of 27 and they want to pretend it's all from real estate, but it's all from training. So uh, the real estate guys, um, they're just, I think, leading they're leading young men in the wrong direction is, is I think what drives me nuts the most. Cause like I know people that have actually gone out and bought a $500,000 home because someone told them to do that. And now they're like barely break even on Airbnb. Airbnb is cracking down in different cities. Like it just drives me nuts that people are literally being led astray and kind of putting themselves in debt, trying to get rich while making someone else rich. I think that's sort of the whole reason why I do this in the first place is just trying to set the record straight on how to actually build wealth from nothing uh, based on my own personal experience. So is real estate a bad way to do that? And is it a bad investment? Real estate's a good investment when you're rich. It's a bad investment when you're poor. So for someone that maybe has six figures or let's say a hundred thousand or less, stay away from real estate, work on making money elsewhere. If you have six figures or like less than six figures, if I'm being brutally honest, like you don't have much money. Like you're kind of still, you're not poor, poor, but like you're not in a place where you're wealthy and you're not like sitting on the beach drinking Mai Tais. So if you're in that place, like I wouldn't be thinking about investing in any asset class that is going to make you rich because you just don't have enough money. Like you need at least to be a, even remotely comfortable, like five, 10 million bucks. The chances of you turning $100,000 into $5 million in a reasonable timeline by investing in real estate is just, Zero, like it's just not gonna happen. So how about your own home though? Like, should you rent or should you buy your house? I rent. So, and people ask me this all the time. Cause like I I could buy borderline any home I want, just cash, mm-hmm. like no problem. But if you actually look at the cost of buying the home, the cost of maintaining the home and everything else relative to renting, it makes no sense. Like I'm, I'm my place in London, uh, if I were, I rent it, if I were to buy it, it would cost me just monthly on the mortgage three to four times more than my monthly rent. And I have the down payment and the hassle of home ownership and everything else. By renting, I can take that money and actually put it into the stock market and it appreciates on its own. So uh, I, I'm friends with uh, some billionaires uh, who have a home in London and homes around the world. They also rent. I would say more and more of my wealthy friends rent and the ones that do buy only buy because they want to like kind of go crazy with it. I have a friend in LA. uh, He bought Pharrell's home, like the singer. Really? It's it's sick. I've I've been over to it. Uh, And it was like, I think it was like 18 million bucks or something. And when he bought it, it had like a skate park in the backyard and like all this like Pharrell Mm. specific stuff. 
And they just wanted that home because it has this sick view over LA. I uh, got the pool and everything else, but they wanted to like rip the skate yard up and like make it theirs. And you can't really do that with a rental. Like you can't completely, re- they've probably put like $5 million into it. That is the only scenario where it makes sense to buy. If you just want to go crazy and customize your house. But if you're doing it for money reasons, I think in general, there is a, what I call an ownership premium where it's cheaper to rent things than to buy things, but it, it does feel kind of nice to own things sometimes. Yeah. So some things I'll pay the ownership premium for. I think what people struggle with is that rental uh, money is just you know, wasted, it's gone. Yep. And they don't see that you can actually put the down payment and everything else in some other location or some other investment to get more money back from it, a better return. Yeah, yeah. You can take your down payment and literally just put it in the stock market and make that same money that often will just pay for the rent that you're paying. And then people don't consider the the interest that you're paying on your, your mortgage. Oftentimes, if you own the home for five years, you might think you've paid off 20% of it or whatever. You've paid off like 2% of it because you pay the interest more upfront. So uh, listen, I bought a home in San Francisco, sold it three years later, lost about $220,000. Like really? I've made the mistake. We are taught this narrative from a young age that buying a home is a good thing to do. It's almost yep. like a life achievement. Yeah. Why is that? Why, why is that what we're taught? A lot of the things that you're taught from a young age worked for the last generation. I'll say that. So if you were growing up, my context is the US. If you're growing up in the 50s, 60s in the US, and you bought your little home for like $25,000 on your part-time job down at the grocery store, and you could do that. Like that home is now worth a million dollars. And so naturally the people that are teaching you that often came from that generation, especially that, you know, raising us. It's the, it's the people that did that in their childhood or in their, their adulthood. But the asset class has just changed so much. I would say the biggest reason why it no longer makes sense to actually own a home is the way that money has flown into residential real estate. Like if you look at the world's largest investors like the Blackstone Group and things like that, they are just buying up real estate left and right, bringing up the prices to where it no longer has that low, relatively low entry cost with the high upside. It's just the world has changed so much that uh, you're just sort of following the old, old school rules. Like I'd much rather you invest in, frankly, in skills and an internet business, something that actually scales more in the modern age not this way that people made money 50 years ago. Speaking of building a business, at what stage did you decide or maybe realize that you are entrepreneurial? So I I think a lot of people grow up feeling like, I don't know, when you hear these success stories, they're like, you know, I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I always knew like it was in it for me. That wasn't me. I think I was actually so like we just grew up really poor and I I was so far from when you say really poor can you describe what was that situation yeah how poor are we talking yeah so when I was four my parents divorced my mom I went to live with my mom she declared bankruptcy we were basically homeless at that point my mom was a barista at a coffee shop so I would sleep in the coffee shop while she worked and then uh, eventually we got taken in uh, by this like there's a Tibetan monastery in Ithaca, New York, where I grew up, and they took me and my mom in for a year. And we just sort of like slept in like, you know, a mattress on the floor there and sort of slowly built our way back up. But my childhood was very much, you know, sleeping in the back of the coffee shop, going into the soup kitchen to get meals. And I, I didn't really think that I was like necessarily destined for anything greater than that like i would see these people in in nice homes and fancy cars and it it wasn't clear to me that i could even work hard like work smart and get there it was just like they get to live a different life than me it'd be the equivalent of me thinking one day i'm going to wake up and be like the president of china like it's just clearly that's not going to happen that's not in the cards for me at all so i didn't grow up thinking i was going to be an entrepreneur i became an entrepreneur really out of desperation um and probably just being really frustrated trying to do manual work. Like one of the key moments for me was I was 12 years old and my friend Matt was mowing lawns and he was like, hey, do you want to come alongside with me? Make some extra money. So I said, yeah, I'll I'll come mow lawns with you. And we went to this guy's house and it was like 100 degrees Fahrenheit out. This is in the heat of summer in South Carolina. Dust just like all over the place. And we, we mow the heck out of this guy's lawn. We mow it, we trim the hedges, we 
you know, cut the weeds back, you name it. Eight hours later, we're done. And we're just like completely disgusting. The guy comes out and he's like, hey, thanks so much for mowing the lawn. Like you guys did a great job. Here's 20 bucks. You guys can split that. So I walk home, Matt's got 10 bucks. I got 10 bucks. And I was like, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm never doing that again. And so <laughs> that's when I started thinking like, how can I actually make money in a way that is not eight hours baking in the sun for 10 bucks? Um, and the other thing that like my first business came shortly after, probably just because of the pain of that. Uh, I was 12 and I started this business that made me a thousand dollars in a week. And so like just c contrasting that. And what was that business? Uh, so I was addicted to video games. Video games growing up were my escape. Mm. I wanted to, you know, my life sucks. So I was like, video games are fantasy. I can get out of that. And I was addicted to this game called RuneScape at the time online multiplayer game and i noticed that people were buying gold in the game for real money and you could sell like a million gold for 20 bucks so i was like i could just mine the gold in the game and sell it and make more money mowing lawns but what if i could actually automate that and that was where my first like aha moment i found something called a macro which is basically you can just program the computer to do a number of steps in order and i programmed the computer to mine the gold for me and so i'd have my computer running 24 7 mining gold and then I set up my eBay shop. I had to lie because I was 12 years old. So I told PayPal I was 18, set it up uh, and started selling gold online. And within a week, I sold like 50 million gold, made a thousand bucks. A week and a half later, my accounts all got banned. I like didn't really know sophistication. Uh, but that was the first, I think, a moment where I was like, wait, I just thought of an idea spent a little bit of time working on it and turned that idea into money. You seem to talk very casually about doing these things at 12 years old. And even if there are maybe a couple of other, you know, people out there doing it, that's quite a rare thing. And I'm trying to make this distinction between nature and nurture in entrepreneurship. Yep. The, the nurture in which you grew up, I'm sure helped a little bit, as you said, but is there a bit of nature there, something that's innate in you, maybe biologically that puts you in the position to have those thoughts at such a young age? I am really willing to just do things almost. I think if I was more intelligent, I would like try to sit down and think through the right way to do things, you know, what could go wrong, things like that. But from a young age, I, and again, I just, I just actually don't think I'm world-class smart. I think I'm like decently smart, but I'm smart enough to try things, but not so smart that I don't think of all the, like the correct way to do things. So most of the businesses I jump into, I jump in, only knowing that it's possible, not knowing all the smarter reasons why you shouldn't do it. So maybe you're missing that fear that actually, if you were smarter, you might have. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think, I just don't have, I don't have much of a fear of failure because entrepreneurial ventures aren't risky. Like you go in, you fail, you learn something, you move on. It's not this huge risk that people make it out to be. So I'm just very willing to try things, fail, try things, fail. And I've failed a bunch, but some things work. So you've never felt awkward about selling things. Um, I mean, we had Daniel Priestley on the podcast before and he said his mentor said to take out a thousand out of his bank, stick it in his pocket and walk around with it because it changed his mindset around money. And when he asked for a thousand, he thought, oh, it's just pocket change Yeah. versus actually asking for an arm and a leg. So when you started selling things for slightly more, did you ever have that awkwardness or that didn't really come? The awkwardness came from selling when I was pitching investors. Because like you're telling an investor in Silicon Valley that you're gonna be worth, your company's gonna be worth a billion dollars. And behind the scenes, you hate your company. Like you think your team kind of sucks. Sales are not going the way they need to go. Uh, the product's breaking like every hour. And you're going in front of the world's best investors and saying, my product's amazing. My team's amazing. Market's amazing. And like, it's just all up and to the right. I think that, uh, cognitive dissonance between I'm an amazing company. You should give me $5 million after meeting with me for 30 minutes uh, and going back to the company. That can be so painful that literally when I was fundraising, meeting with investors, I had a rule. I didn't go into the office because I, it was so painful to go from like, man, I really think our company is not doing well to pitching us being great. So I would just disappear. I said, listen, you're not going to really see me in the office. You're not going to be able to ask me things about the company. Don't ask me how fundraising is going. I'm just going to disappear. And I would go through this sort of like hour long routine every morning where I'd 
convince myself we had a great company. So you're selling yourself first. You sell yourself you're first. To sell yeah, yeah. I think that's the actually the real secret is you have to sell yourself before you go out and pitch someone else, or else it just doesn't come across quite with the same conviction that you need to in that arena. But how do you convince investors that they should invest? Yeah. So I, I had to learn this a very painful way by first failing to convince anyone to invest in us many, many times. Uh, and, and now I've pitched some of the world's you know, smartest, most successful investors, richest investors. And the thing you learn is when you go into an investor meeting, even if it's a 60 minute meeting, you actually win or lose that investment in the first two minutes. So the, it's called frame control. And generally, when you walk into an investor meeting, the frame that they are viewing the conversation through is, I meet with a thousand companies a year, and I invest in one to two. So just by nature of the odds, you are naturally not one of the one or two that I'm gonna invest in. Like I'm gonna go through this meeting, waste an hour of my life, say, hey, this was really interesting, we'll be in touch, and never follow up, and never invest in your company. So you have to snap the investor out of that frame before you even begin the conversation. And so the way I do that, I walk into an investor meeting and before we even start, I don't say, hey, so-and-so investor, you know, thanks for taking time to meet with us. I'm really excited for this because I'm already sort of saying like, I'm here begging for money from you. This investor is on a pedestal. I walk in and I say, listen, so-and-so, it's great to meet with you. Uh, you know, Susie, who referred me here, uh, has said great things. So I'm looking forward to learning more about how you work with portfolio companies, how you add value to your investments and to see how we might work together. So, you know, why don't we start off? I did a little bit of research online before I came, but if you could give me more of your background, tell me more about how you do that, then I'll give you my background and I'll transition into about our company. And now he's pitching you. He's pitching me. And that's the mindset that you need, even if you don't believe it, you need to sell yourself that you are the one of 1000 and you're not there begging for money, you're vetting which investor gets to write you the million dollar check. I did this so well once, and you can do this over email. So I did it with this investor over email where we got connected and he had some like family in the car dealership space and we were selling into the car dealership space. So I was just like, hey, I see that you're connecting the car dealership space. Um, that's awesome. I think you could be a real valuable investor for us. Definitely want to learn more about how, you know, those connections would actually come into play with us, how you could help us out and things like that. And we just kind of maintained this frame from day one I met up with him at the Battery Club, which is this like private swanky social club in San Francisco. We sit down and he just starts buying me cocktails. And the whole time he's just pitching me on how awesome he is, how he's going to be a great investor. He's going to do all this thing for us. And afterwards, like, so can I invest? And I was like, you know, I'll think about it and I'll follow up. I followed up, said, okay, we'll let you in for a quarter million dollars. And it's this like super strong framework. I'm letting him invest in me. And he was the first investor in that like fundraising round. We had no one interested. But just by maintaining that frame and believing it, he comes in. Then when you go to other investors, you got 250K is already in. They come in 500K and the next thing you know, like you are that company that's turning away investors. Presumably to make this applicable for people that might not be, you know, trying to win millions of dollars for investment. Yep. Presumably this can be applied to, you know, things on a smaller level, job interviews or conversations with potential clients as well. Yeah. I, I think if you're selling authentically, you are actually trying to learn why this might not be a good fit for the person on the other side of the table. So you are asking the prospect, if you're selling a you know, software or something, what are you looking for? What are you looking to get out of this? And I have, we had this one uh, Russian oligarch who got like connected with us and he owned a bunch of like Lamborghini dealerships and Ferrari dealerships in America. He was trying to buy our software and I was like, listen, it's actually not going to work for you. Like what you're looking for, he wanted to do these like really bespoke custom sales process. And we were like more the Toyota sales process. And I said, listen, you can't buy our product. Like I can sell it to you and I'll make money, but you won't benefit from it. If you actually believe in your product so much that you will turn away a customer, if you believe in yourself so much, you will turn away a job that might pay you a lot of money, but is not going to make you fulfilled. You're not going to do the right for that company. Then you're ironically more likely to get the sales, more likely to get the job because you're coming in with a genuine frame that you want to find a place where both sides are successful. If you're just trying to sell and like shove your product uh, down anyone's throat, they, they can sense that. And so you get less sales and the sales that you do get are less happy with you. So it just doesn't work. You, you have to be 
always vetting opportunities. I've always found that when you're selling something, if you genuinely don't need them to buy it, the reception they get, you're, you're more likely to sell it. Yep. And at the start, it, it might be a case of you have to pretend you don't need it, but really you really do. Yep. But by having abundance elsewhere and having other options, it makes it obviously a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the, the, the trick as a young entrepreneur is convincing yourself you have options, you have abundance when you're flat out broke. That is the hardest part of the game because if you are desperate, no one's gonna buy from you. They're gonna, I mean, people will give you a chance but it's very rare and you're getting handouts, you're getting charity. You're not getting real things that will stick around. The way that I handle that is I am like so new agey woo woo on this. I will go for like a two hour walk in the morning, just like telling myself I'm wealthy, telling myself I have all these things, dreaming of all the things that I one day want to have just to get myself in that mindset. So I'm trying to program my mind to believe that so that I, I don't have to fake it and force it in the conversation, I faked it and forced it all morning. So I kind of have that going into the meeting. For young entrepreneurs, how important would you say it's to uh, follow your passion, you know, that old age advice? Some of the worst advice you can follow as a young entrepreneur is to follow your passion F for a, a lot of reasons. One is just simply your passions might be things that no one is willing to pay for. Like if you're really passionate about knitting, that's great, go knit, but no one's gonna pay you for knitting, at least not enough to like, get you out of your situation. If you are a trust fund kid and you've already got 50 million bucks in the bank, you want to go knit, have fun, like go do it. If you want to actually build a successful business, even if you're passionate about it, the passion will run out. Like passion works when you're in that fun zero to one phase, you've brought in a couple of buddies and you're like building the product. Passion doesn't work when you have to lay off half your company because sales are not where they should be, or an investor pulled out, all these different things. Your passion drains really quickly. So I would rather you find something that if you follow this path, you will achieve the most important goals in your life. And that will sustain you even when things really suck in your life and your world and your company. Because you will know that, I, hey, this is not fun. This is some of the loneliest, darkest days of my life. But by going through these, I will get to the dream that I've always had. And if you're knitting or whatever, following your passion, and it's not clear that it's going to get you to your lifelong goal, you'll just give up on it because it's not going to be fun forever. And so I think following your passion is just, it's, it's dumb advice from like, sort of like chat GPT style uh, advice that you see on YouTube and stuff today. I suppose if you tie your passion to the business and then when you eventually sell it, you kind of lose your identity in a way as well. So by not being so passionate about it, you don't lose everything. You've got a life outside of the business. Yeah, I, I think you will lose your identity regardless. Still, yeah, yeah. I, I did. So I, I had a big aha moment when I was 17. Uh, I was a world champion martial artist. So I, I competed in the Junior Olympics in Judo, world champion in karate, kung fu, taekwondo at 16, and then again at 17. And yeah, like 17, 18, I noticed this weird pattern where if you, if you and I hung out, it was damn near impossible that we were going to hang out for more than 30 minutes and you wouldn't walk away knowing I was a world champion. And it wasn't like I was just walking in like bragging, but it was so part of my identity that it was hard for me to speak about myself without speaking about that part of my life. I think you get caught up in tying your identity to whatever you're doing if you're like serious about it. So as an entrepreneur, you will become tied to your your identity is your company. Like I was the CEO with a 200 person team and that was my identity. When I left that this year, I had to find a new identity and now it's a YouTuber. So people- But that's what you do, right? So there you just, again, tied your identity to what you now do. Yes. So if we take that away, do you, are you aware of what your identity is without what you do? Yeah, I, I would say the core identity I have is someone who is passionate about life, loves to travel, financial freedom, like th those things you, I guess you could take my money away, but <laughs> you can't really take away my core, core values. Um, having core values like that does allow you to weather the ups and downs. I definitely see the benefits of removing the need for passion if you're trying to build a massive, uh, you know, empire. What about for solo entrepreneurs or small, medium-sized businesses who they just want to make money, live life on their terms? 
without passion, is there a chance that they won't necessarily have the motivation? Because they might not they, they might not be motivated to build something amazing. If we take passion away, are they going to struggle to even you know become a, a decent freelancer, for example, or or just have a, a small team or an agency or something like that? Let me think about that. I I think. Yeah, as a freelancer, as someone who's a solopreneur, just sort of doing your small thing. If you want to stay small, like I said, passion passion can work. If your goal is $1,000 a month or $2,000 a month, like, yeah, I'm sure there's enough people in your circle of passion to get you to that price point, to get you to that revenue number. If you are actually trying to move your financial realm in a meaningful way, you need a very large number of people that are buying your thing. If you are happen to be passionate about selling software to large enterprises and like you struck diamond, like you, you get so lucky there. But if your passion just has a small... Because presumably you could make, there are people out there making $10,000 a month from knitting. So there must be, you know, surely you could take anything, whether it's knitting or whether it's uh, painting garden furniture and make quite a good nice living from it i guess when you take it to that extreme though making that much money from knitting and that's your passion are you going to lose the passion for knitting because you're turning it into such of a, a business i think so i i have a lot of passions um that i i very my mind wants to make businesses out of them like even with youtube now i'm like i want to I, I i love building businesses but i don't want to do that um i do a lot of photography travel videography, like I, I do all these things, but I, I've i been very deliberate in keeping my passions separate from becoming work. And I think this is one of the traps. If, if you make your passion your work, it's very hard to separate those two, like when you're in the activity and you now have to do your passion. You're not doing it because you wake up wanting to do it. You're not doing it because you feel good that day and you want to go do your thing. Like you have to do your passion because it's what pays your bills. Speaking of hobbies and passions, if you are an entrepreneur and you do want to build something big, yep. where do hobbies and passions come into that? Should we push them aside or should they, should we intertwine them with trying to build something? So there's this sort of mindset uh, that you'll see a lot online, monk mode, uh, you know, deep focus, whatever you call it, where it's like, you're going to cut out all distractions in your life and you're just going to do one thing. I kind of think that's a little crap. I, when you're building a business, because your identity is just going to end up tied to it, you 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 can meditate all you want, doesn't matter. Like you, you are tied to the ups and downs of your business. If you just have one thing in life that you are solely focused on, you're going to have good days and you're going to have really, really bad days. What I've always done is just trying to have one other passion that balances it out. For me, it was kickboxing. So it was not unusual in my company. I'd walk in with like a bloody lip and a black eye because I was like kickboxing hardcore. By doing that, I might have the worst day in the company history. Still go to kickboxing, have an awesome sparring session, get out some of that anger. <laughs> and and you're, you're so focused in that moment, you can't be thinking about the company because you're gonna get kicked in the head. So I think it's actually really important to have just one other thing that you're also actively tying your identity to and really putting passion into. They balance each other out so that you're just not this crazy person with the highest highs and lowest lows. Do you think anyone can become rich and become an entrepreneur? Or do you think you have to have certain attributes that you're born with or even you nurture that helps you get to that point? Anybody can become rich only because becoming rich is a surprisingly straightforward thing. Like I can't become an NBA basketball player. I'd like to, but I'm 5'8". There's just, there are certain things that I just can't overcome. You have physical requirements like athletic requirements, those things are keeping me outside of the realm of being an NBA player. Becoming rich is something that so many people have done in a very straightforward way. I would say getting rich is, is one of the most straightforward things, but it doesn't make it easy. So anybody can do it, but few are willing to do it. Um, the analogy I would use is it's kind of like losing weight. Uh, there's no revolutionary science that you need to learn to lose weight cut back on eating sugars like yeah, calorie deficit yeah it's That's literally it. calories in calories out and you will lose weight so it's not the knowledge that keeps people from losing mm -hmm. weight it's not the knowledge that keeps people from getting rich it's just that they don't want to actually do the things it's kind of like um you're just not 
willing to put in the effort. And I think that actually comes from a lack of self-belief. If you knew that if you put these things uh, together, that if you put in the hours, five years, 10 years from now, you would make it, almost everyone would do it. So it's it's not a lack of skills. It's not a lack of knowledge. It's actually just a lack of self-belief. Is there an argument to be made that some people just don't want to make it? Even if you, even if they they thought I could, if I wanted to, I have the knowledge to do so, just something isn't driving me to make a move. You don't need to make a hundred million dollars. Like You can have your, whatever goal it is, but I, I think there's, what, what actually happens is people just settle for so much less than, than they wanted in life. You had all these dreams, you had all these goals. Like if you go to a kid and ask them, what do they want in life? They're never like, well, I want to work a basic job, have a reasonable sized house, but not too big. Um, and you know, one swing, now they, they want two swimming pools and 10 cars and the jet out back. Like, When do we lose that spark though? Or not we, but when do people lose that spark? So you, one of the worst things that happens to you when you're dreaming as a young entrepreneur, as a young kid, is the adults who gave up on their dreams remind you that you should give up on yours because it's so painful for them to imagine that they could have done it that they don't want you to think you should do it either. And so these people just constantly are reminding you, ah, come on, like be realistic. I'm thinking if they can't do it, then you definitely can't, you know, putting you down because if you succeed, it makes them look bad. I right? think people also say that they don't want money because they've never had a mm. try at it. So it's just so much easier to say it because I feel like I did the same thing as well. And as soon as I started a business and started making a thousand pound in a week, my whole world just changed. You know, the way I perceived everything was completely different. And it's like, I'm never going back. Yeah. Like once you realize you can achieve these things, why wouldn't you do it? But yeah, too many people have given up on their dreams and they want you to give up on your dreams. So if we're surrounded by people who are making us want to give up on our dreams, that might be friends, it might be family. How do we combat that situation? Do we abandon mum and dad and say, fuck you, I'm, I'm going on my own? Or how, how if someone's in that environment where there, no one is inspiring them, everyone is saying that's not possible. Yep. How do they get out of that? If you look at what actually keeps people in poverty in poverty, it is 100% their surroundings. It's their friends that are saying, you won't make it. Like, who do you think you are trying to get rich, to get out of this situation? And you have to actually be kind of cutthroat about it. You do need to review your list of people that you spend time with, your friends, the books you're reading, the, the news articles that you're ingesting, and ask yourself, are these things that are putting me up in life or, or actually trying to keep me where I'm at? And if your friends don't have a higher dream of your future in five years than you're at today, you need to actually get rid of them. You need to remove them from your life. And you don't need to do it in a way that um, is is super cutthroat, but you, you go to them and you say, listen, I wanna make a change in my life. I'm not happy with where I'm at. Here's where I wanna be in five years. And I'm gonna work my butt off to get there. And I hope that as my friend, you're gonna support me in this and like, really encourage me because there's going to be some really bad days where I don't believe in myself. Can you help me kind of get there? And if they're like, come on, man, be realistic. Like, come on. Like, that's not for us. You need to stop hanging out with that friend. They will remind you why you're not supposed to get there because they know all the, the bad things about you, the ways that you failed in the past. And they'll bring those up when you're having your low Is moments. there no room for both? Like, I understand if they're saying you can't accomplish this goal, then of course they need to go. But I feel like I very much do both. Of course, I have these guys that bring me up and my friends have no interest in business that we don't talk about making money. I'm going to go and see seven friends tonight. We're going to have some drinks. We're not going to talk about business, money or anything like that. And I'm going to enjoy myself. So is there that balance or do you think to reach 110 million exit, you can't have that? You can hang around with people that don't want that for themselves, but, but they you just can't bring you down. You cannot hang around with people that don't want success for you. Mm. And that is a very big difference. The people that want to remind you, you are not enough that come on, you failed in the past. You, you can't spend a second around those if you actually want to break out of your situation. But yeah, I don't only hang out with like really rich people. How would you recommend people that maybe do feel like they need to surround themselves with a new group of people? Maybe there's a kid watching in his bedroom who doesn't know anyone who is successful or who has that mindset. How would you recommend to that person how they can find the right people for them? Yeah, well, here's how I did it. So I grew up in South Carolina, like in poverty and wanted to achieve all these things. I think the extreme example, which is what I did, I flew to San Francisco and I just tried to surround myself with 
mentors, with people that were successful. What you actually, what I developed is basically using your network to level up your future network. So I would go to anyone I knew that was even remotely successful. And I'd say, hey, I'm a new CEO trying to build a software company. I don't really know what I'm doing. Do you know anyone who's great at doing this? Do you know anyone who's built a software company successfully? If so, could you introduce me to them? And I would ask them to meet for coffee. And if we hit it off, I would actually give them a chunk of the business if they'd continue to meet with me every couple months. And I would just continuously do that. And by starting from a kid who had nothing, like I've had happy hour with Bill Gates, which was pretty cool. I've been in uh, the penthouse tower of Salesforce Tower in San Francisco with Mark Benioff, the billionaire founder of Salesforce, eating sashimi while the piano like played in the sunset. So you get in these wild situations quite quickly if you just use this sort of like six degrees of separation leveling up. Now, if you are in a place where you don't know anyone successful, everyone around you is living in council estates and you just have nothing, what I would say you want to do then is make sort of a fake mentor group of people that you've never met. So that's this podcast. That's YouTubers that are legit. That's uh, books from people who have done it. And you just try to surround yourself with those influences. And you almost have fake relationships with these people. Like, what, what do I think they would tell me? And your brain is sort of like a mini chat GPT where it can impersonate these people and say, I think so-and-so would tell me to go do this. And so you just go do that. And you, that, that's a way to fake it until you can actually meet these people. How did you actually meet Bill Gates and have this happy hour? Because I, I think we kind of glossed over that. That's a crazy story. <laughs> and what did he teach you? Did you learn anything significant? No, I mean, it was we were just hanging out. So, um, you know, when you're in, I, I'd done this process where, again, I'm just asking people, hey, do you know anyone who's great? And you sort of level up. Uh, and, and by doing that, even when you're not making it, you meet these really incredible people. So I'd met a handful of extremely successful millionaires and billionaires. Um, and they start to invite you to their events. Mm -hmm. And that's when you realize that the same way that you're trying to surround yourself with successful people, they are also surrounding themselves with people at their level or higher. And so, yeah, I ended up at this happy hour in San Francisco with Bill Gates. Um, it's kind of funny because it was a pretty small, it's, it's an event. So there's like 50 of us, um, but it's like everyone in the room is legit. No one is in here to like pickpocket Bill Gates. If you're in the room at this like private event with the bar closed, you're legit. But Bill Gates still walks around with this like circle of bodyguards around really? him. So I think it was like eight bodyguards, literally in like an orb around Bill Gates. And as he moves, the bodyguards like <laughs> move with him. And then when you want to talk to him, the bodyguards like part at the front <laughs> and you like walk in and enter. Um, so people were just like chatting about business and stuff. Most of the conversations with Bill Gates and the reason I didn't have like an extensive conversation, people were walking up and they were like, Bill, like I invented a new technology that um, turns like wastewater into clean drinking water. And I want to put it in a million like homes in Africa. Like, what do you think? And I was like, I'm building software for a car dealership company to make myself rich. Mm. I don't think this is something I want to pitch Bill Gates on. Um, so when he's had enough of the, the people talking to him, does he just signal and then they just close? Yeah, they, <laughs> I, I think eventually they just kind of close up yeah. and, and like he just walks out in this little orb. <laughs> Bro and, has and, got a walking force field. Though. Yeah, yeah. That like, is crazy. Which is, I mean, I've met a bunch of other billionaires who are who are super chill. I've never seen anything like the orb around Bill Gates. He's um, very high profile as well. Though, very so high profile. It's not just the money. Yeah, yeah. He's, so he, you built and sold a business for $110 million. What exactly was that business and how did you go about building it? Yeah. So when I started the business, I had a very clear goal. It wasn't, I want to follow my passion. It wasn't, I, I just wanted to make money. And uh, the way that I thought about it was, I don't need to be the smartest guy in the room. I don't need to reinvent the wheel and come up with some amazing, like the next Facebook. I just want to see how have other young people gotten wealthy and follow that. Success is often like a recipe. If, like if, I'm, if I want to bake a cake, I don't need to be the world's best baker. I can just get a cake recipe, follow that. It will probably turn out okay. So I said, well, how are young people getting rich now? And if you look, Silicon Valley, this is 2014, was kind of the place to be. Snapchat had just turned down $4 billion. Instagram got acquired for a billion dollars. WhatsApp gets acquired for 16 billion. All young guys building businesses and selling them. And I was like, I don't know what's in the water there, but I need to go out there and be there. So I get out there, start meeting these people and realize I need to start a software company. So then the next question is, well, what should my software company be? 
And I started really studying how do, how do you actually decide on a business idea? How do you decide on the right software company? What I learned is every successful like $100 million company or plus has the same three attributes, which is first, they have a large market. If you are tackling a small little market, doesn't matter how well you execute in that market, you just won't be able to have a multi-million dollar outcome. So I wanted a massive like multi-billion dollar market where if I just get like 0.1% of it, I can still sell for hundreds of millions of dollars. And that's exactly what we did. The second thing is you look for a change that's happening in the market. So something that is changing, either a new technology, a new consumer desire that is making your business possible. For us, people were starting to say, hey, I want to buy cars online. There were these studies that were coming out saying last year, 20% of consumers wanted to buy cars online. And what year was this? Sorry. 2014. Okay. So uh, yeah, it was like 20% of consumers want to buy cars online. The next year, 30% of consumers want to buy cars online. So it's clearly like there's a massive market. People want this new thing. And then the third attribute is there's a gap being created by this new technology, this new desire. So for us, it was up to, I think, 48% of people want to buy cars online. 0% can. Like you don't have to be that smart to say, well, if someone could help them buy cars online, I could probably make some money doing that. So that's literally what we did. We entered in, we said, let's build that gap. And like, this is so simple that it's literally how every successful business is built. Like if you actually, a lot of people don't know this, but Airbnb was literally made by the great financial crisis of 2007, 2008. Basically before 2007, 2008, homes had become so affordable because mortgages were cheap. They were easy. People were getting them left and right. So people started buying these massive homes, bigger than they need with spare bedrooms, you name it. And then the crisis comes people all of a sudden can't afford their home. So they're living in big homes that they can't afford with extra rooms that they don't need. Airbnb has started right at the like middle of the financial crisis and says, you can rent out your homes and rent out a spare room, make your money. Now you can afford your mortgage, keep your home. And it's all of a sudden the best idea ever. It's just finding some inflection point in a really large market and then filling that. That's all you need to do to build a successful business. How do you go about finding that though? Because obviously if it was that obvious, then lots of people would jump on it um, yep. because they'd see the gap. So is it about asking the right questions? So we did very extensive market research. And if you want to start a business, I would say like spend two, three months just working on the market and the idea before you actually start building anything. Because that, that is going to determine actually most of your success is picking the right idea. So we built a spreadsheet. Me, when I say we, me and my co-founder, and we listed hundreds of markets and we looked at, well, how big is the market? How much do they spend on the thing that we'd want to sell them software? And if it was a big market, but they don't spend much on software, we moved on um, and we just built a spreadsheet. And then the third thing was, is there anything changing in the market? Is there a new technology? And you don't have to be smart. You don't have to like come up with great ideas. Go to the big consulting companies, Capgemini, Ernst & Young. They have armies of analysts that study these markets and write reports on what's changing because they want to go hire or get hired by massive Fortune 500 companies to teach them these things. But they give you the report for free. So we downloaded all these reports, looked it up and said, oh, here are the ways the different markets are changing. You just steal their ideas, basically. Um, and then you just pick the one that sort of aligns closest with your passions. You might have, I had bought cars before, so I was like, I know buying cars sucks. Um, and you just enter the market. Like it's, I, I don't actually think it's that hard. It, you just have to, understand the fundamentals, which I just covered, and then actually just follow those. So did you get the product right straight away or did you have to adapt as you went through? We totally screwed it up. Uh, <laughs> so, so we started selling the product early on and it was it was very simple. Buy a car online and you can you know get, get to get from the dealership. And we thought we were doing really well. We'd actually grown from zero to 22 customers in a couple months each paying $1,000 a month. So like we had this little business, $22,000 a month. We'd raised a million dollars, had convinced all eight of uh, my team members to sort of you know quit their jobs, come join me. We're on this mission together. And then I had this two week period where literally I'd walk into the office and every single day, Katie, who ran our customer success, would come over to me and say, hey, Micaiah, like so-and-so just canceled. So-and-so just canceled. And at the end of two weeks, I'd gone from 22 customers, $22,000 a month, to zero. And the day after that, I walked in and fired basically my whole team because I knew that we were going to run out of cash really quick and we had clearly missed by a mile. It wasn't like 
10% of the customer, like everybody canceled and we totally screwed it up. And this is purely because the product isn't good enough. The, I had to find out. <laughs> At that point, I was just panicking, but I was like, I, so we have missed with something. So I went to the customers and I said, listen, you bought from us, you believed in a vision. We didn't deliver that. Can you like, I just wanna be really humble here. Can you teach me where I screwed up? And they were actually really willing to say, listen, here were the flaws in your product. Here were the gaps in what you were building. And the, the reality was that we just didn't know enough about the car industry. So we went into the dealerships. I went through two weeks of car salesman training where I got like trained and qualified to sell cars just to understand their process. And by going in really humble, much more humble than we entered the market the first time. The first time we were like, we're Silicon Valley hotshots. These car dealerships don't know anything. We're going to build software and blow their mind. And like, that's what we started doing. And then it all failed. Um, by going and saying, we don't know anything, just like teach us about your business. What can we actually build? That's when we started to understand how to actually ask the right questions, build the right software. And that's what really took us from zero to 110 million. When you're at that low point, having to fire the people that have bet their lives you know, on your business, and you said, look, we're going to go to this amazing place with the company. Did you ever think about like, maybe entrepreneurship isn't for me. Maybe I'm going to stop here. I can't do this again, you know, go through that feeling. Yeah. <laughs> there's you you listen to these interviews with great entrepreneurs and they always say things like i always knew we were going to make it i always knew we were going to be successful even in the lowest of moments that was never me i maybe i'm just wired the wrong way but i would say 98 out of 100 days i walked into the company i thought we were going bankrupt for sure one out of 100 days i thought maybe we'll do okay and then the last one out of 100 days, I thought we were unstoppable. Like we were just going to be the greatest company on planet Earth. No one could touch us. And I just started living for those one out of 100 days where I felt invincible. And because I knew another one would come. And I just tried to not quit until the next day come. Right. And, and there were a lot of times when I wanted to quit. Actually, one of the biggest ones was about four years into the business, things are still not working. Things are totally failing. And I messaged a bunch of my mentors, these people that I had built up, you know, this multi-billion dollar network of, and said, listen, I think this is sort of the end of the road for me. And there was one mentor in particular um, who had become an ambassador. I won't, I won't give like all the details because he's uh, a very public figure, but he was an ambassador to one of the European countries. So he's in his government position, like doing his thing. And I email him and I say, listen, I'm probably quitting. And he calls me at like midnight his time. So I'm like, wow, this is pretty serious. And I thought he was just going to be like, hey, man, I get it. We've all been there. Like sometimes you just have to know when to throw it in and things like that. And instead, he just chewed me out. He was like, what you're doing is like adopting a puppy and then deciding two years later, you don't want a dog. Like that's so crappy of you. I can't believe you just abandoned this. And he kind of just chewed me out so strongly. I felt embarrassed to quit. So I was like, OK, I'll just keep going then. Um, and this happened not with him, but probably two or three times in my journey where I was just like, this is too painful, but nothing's working. I quit. And every time I'd get five, 10 calls and no one would allow me to do it. They would just say, you're making a huge mistake and I'm really disappointed in you. And I think that is kind of to your question earlier, can you hang around with people that don't believe in you? No, you can hang around with people that are not achieving the world's highest success, but if they actually are the people that will call you and say, yeah, man, come on, like, let's be real. You're never going to make it anyways. You, you just can't have those people because you will have those low moments where if they're available, they will tell you to quit. Is there ever a right moment to quit, though? I know Stephen Bartlett talks about this. One of his um, strongest uh, strengths is quitting, you know, when something isn't going anywhere. And he can kind of identify that before, you know, putting too much work in and going down that road, sunk cost fallacy, all yep. of that. So yeah, is there a moment where actually having those friends around you, making you carry on with the thing you're doing is a bad thing? I think quitting when things are not going well is something that young entrepreneurs do too often. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, re I meet a lot of young entrepreneurs who are like, I had this business, tried it for six months, didn't go anywhere. Now I'm on this business, six months, didn't go anywhere. Six. That sort of jumping from market to market, from idea to idea, you think it's the idea, it's the market, it's actually probably just you. So you you can jump around business to business, but you're the same 
crappy leader, crappy CEO, crappy entrepreneur who doesn't know how to make a business work. I, I think if you give it five years and it's still not working, it's probably time to maybe think about something else. But I would say if you're quitting anything less than 24 months, you're just quitting too early. You just haven't given it enough time to even learn the lessons that can get you to somewhere. That said, what I never do is I never risk my own financial like ability to pay bills, to live on a business. I've been very adamant about this from every business I've ever started. I'm not the entrepreneur that wants to max out credit cards. That is like, uh, you know, getting a loan on the home. And if, if this business doesn't make it, we're losing the home. I think that is just such a foolish thing to do because when you're starting out, when you're first building your business, you don't know the things that you don't know and you don't know how long it's going to take you to learn those things. So I would rather you keep risk basically to zero on a personal level or very little. Mm -hmm. And that gives you time to actually learn what you're doing. And, and, and then you can develop the skills to actually build a business. But quitting early on is, uh, I think it's just what most people in society do. And it's why most people in society aren't living the life they want. So how are you able to start the business without risking your own money? Is this purely just getting funding, pitching investors? So the last business that I built and sold was a venture invested company. We raised a ton of $21 million from investors and that really offset the risk. But I had done businesses before bootstrapped. So when you're bootstrapping a business, the thing you want to do is just stay super lean. It, it, you know, that's kind of maybe where you're in a side hustle phase where you have some other income, where you're not putting your eggs all in one basket. And you can build that business without actually maxing out the credit cards. If you have to max out the credit cards, it's probably actually because you don't know what you're doing and you think throwing more money on the problem will solve it. And reality is you're not being resourceful enough. You're not thinking creatively enough on how to build a business. When we built Prodigy, the last business, that is when I said, okay, I'm building in a market where venture investors will actually play. And, and I was very deliberate that I, I, there's this sort of journey that you have to decide. It's um, called King versus Rich. And, and I read this book that kind of taught me this. The King journey is I'm a bootstrapper. I, you know, everyone that works for me, I have freelancers. I travel the world, do what I want. Um, and you can build the business there, but you're, it's not the best way to get rich. You have full control over your life. And I had made a very deliberate decision. I'm this, this, you know, chance at bat, I'm going to go the rich journey. I'm going to give up control, give up my company and raise money from investors in order to get rich. And I, and I knew that that came with a certain uh, lifestyle change that I wouldn't have. I can't just not go to work because I have investors that are, you know, it's their money and they're making sure it's working. Um, so that, that pressure forced me to just build the business in a certain way. But um, it also allowed me to not risk any of my own capital. Like I lived off savings for the first six months of the business, but I never invested my money into the business. To this day, I, I didn't put a dollar in. And how does that pressure actually work? So they invest the money in you and you can't just take the days off because you've got to be there. But how does that actually work? So early on, when you raise money from investors, th the pressure is really, man, these people believed in me. And they gave me money, often it's angel investors. So it's like, this guy doesn't have a hundred million dollars. He has 2 million and he gave me 50,000. So like, it's kind of real money to them. And I just don't want to let them down. Mm. That's how you feel it early on. As you get bigger and bigger, you get bigger investors. They have board seats and it is their job. They meet with you every month, every quarter. And the only decision that ever gets decided in a board meeting is should we fire the CEO? No other real decisions get made because if the board is deciding should we hire this new sales rep? Should we hire the head of HR or whatever? What they're actually thinking in their head is we need to fire the CEO because the CEO is not making decisions. If your VP of engineering is screwing up, we need to fire the CEO. It's not we need to fire the VP of engineering. So I was very aware that that's, that's my board's only job. It's just to fire me if I'm screwing this thing up. And this is one of the more like painful things that happened with me when I was running the company is I loved my investors. I had these two board members. They were super cool. They would like invite me over. We'd drink fancy wine. We'd make pizza together. We had this really fun, friendly relationship. But because they kind of always have the gun to your head secretly, every time I'd get a text from them, a phone call, my heart rate would just go to like 200 beats a minute. And oftentimes it would be, hey, Makai, are you and your wife free Saturday? Like I'm having some friends over. You should swing. By. I was freaking out. 
And so I think just that that external pressure becomes overwhelming because you're like, they will fire me. And at this point, you know, I've been running the company for five years. They can take this all away. How does that work though? In the sense, like if you were to say, so you own hundred percent of your company, let's yep. say you get investors and give away 30%, you still own the majority. So then would the board still have to come in and they can still remove you, even though you own the majority of the company or are you giving away more than you own? So investors get special rights that you don't right. get as a founder. So as an, as a founder, you get what's called common stock. Common stock means you own the same stock as the employees, as like regular people. Investors get what's called preferred stock. Preferred stock has preferred privileges and they will document what those specific preferred privileges are. They assign those privileges to the preferred stock. So even if, the, if you have an investor that owns 10% of the company, they could have three board seats and you only have one. So in any vote, you're automatically outvoted. These things happen all the time. So for us, even though we had um, lots of common stock ownership, we didn't have control of the company. And that's just, the investors need to do this because they're getting investments from multi-billion dollar pensions, endowments. And if you just run off with all the money because you have control of the company, it doesn't affect just you or the investors. Now you're stealing from like hospitals, from universities and things like that. And they get really pissed. So by having those large investors, the investors just and force I, control. I presume that there's a way to set it up so that they don't have all of these rights. But if you did that, then they just wouldn't invest. Yeah, if you're like the the super sexy startup, the, you know, the hottest kid on the block, you can do uh, sort of these, uh, what they call founder shares. Founder shares are they're a special class and you can set them up so that you have like 10 votes for every vote a preferred share has. So uh, Travis Kalanick at Uber famously did this where he had insane control over the company and Travis was fired from Uber. Like if that's not like obvious, like Travis was 100% fired from Uber but they fired him and then he still was able to run the company, even though he was no longer the CEO because he had all these rights. Um, and it's very uncool for an investor to do this, but his largest investors actually sued him for like $600 million to get him off of the company because it, it, it you lose your reputation if you sue someone you invested in. But the investors were looking at saying, listen, if Uber goes public, we're personally making billions here. So screw our reputation, screw like social credit, we're going to sue Travis because I can make a couple billion dollars personally, and that's worth it. So you can get around it, but then, yeah, you end up in. That is interesting. I, I really didn't know that. that yeah, there's a lot of stuff that happens in Silicon Valley that no one talks about because investors are so. They have their reputation on the line. I, I know so many people who have lied to investors, set up fraudulent like fundraising schemes, completely faked their metrics, raised hundreds of millions of dollars, and it never comes out. Because if the investors admit that you frauded them, then they won't be able to raise money from more investors because they're not even investing their own capital. You're starting to see it now. Um, like IRL, I think is the latest one. It's like this app. They're worth $1.5 billion. It turns out 95% of their users were just bots that they made in-house. So you're starting to see it because the economy is crashing and investors have to start being like, we need to sue people and get our money back. But when the economy is good, fraud happens all the time and no one talks about it. Just sort of goes under the road. So do you wow. think the um, the tech space is still something that people should be going into to make loads of money or has, has that like bubble popped at this point? Um, because valuations are obviously going down at the moment. Yep. I think there's, there's two tech spaces that you can enter. There's the high flying Silicon Valley. I'm going to go raise $50 million from investors and build like a multi-billion dollar IPO business. That space is actually always going to be worth it because you're building technology for the next generation. You're building technology for a future wave of interest and there's always going to be a market there. Valuations go up, valuations go down, doesn't matter, you'll get rich. But entering that space, you have to want to be in that space. It's not like a, a casual thing. You are going to be in the world's most competitive arena with investors, with software companies, and you're competing against the world's smartest people. So if you don't want to be in that space, that's fine. But the general tech space, which is what I would call, you're a kid, you have access to a laptop, you can go online and do things. That is the only place you should be building a business right now. If you are not doing something that is internet connected, that has some sort of tech element to it, I, I, I just can't understand like why, like why would you be doing that? Like why would you build a toy store 
in person and not sell it online. Like you want to have some online aspect of your business or you're just cutting yourself off from the global population. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know from working with lots of um, fintech companies, it's it's kind of changed now. Instead of looking for users, they're more looking for people actually trading money. So has has that been a, a shift in the entire industry because of these bots that they can get to sign up? There are in all markets, real estate, tech, you name it. There are cycles that you go through. Mm-hmm. So the big tech crash of '99 was was sort of a famous one where it was. Uh, users over everything else doesn't matter if we're burning millions of dollars doesn't matter if they're not making us any money we just want to grow 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 and then tech bubble pops everything collapses and all of a sudden it's profits Mm -hmm. profits are the only thing that matters it's all about cash flow get lean fire everyone and then everyone forgets about that things start bubbling up again Mm -hmm. uh 2020 2021 people are literally selling companies for billions of dollars with like a couple million dollars of revenue that's not sustainable Mm -hmm tech bubble collapses again. Now, look what's happening. Public markets, tech companies are laying off 20%, 30%. People cannot get jobs in tech because all the big companies laid them off. It's just because the flavor of the month right now is profitability. So it's not that you can't play in those realms, but you do have to understand like what's sexy to investors right now. So what's sexy right now is cash flow. What's sexy is profits. And so if you're going to be in the tech world in that arena, you're going to be cutting back on this like growth at all cost. You're going to be moving your business more towards profit base, towards cash flow. And then things will relax probably in a couple of years and you're back to grow at all cost. When did you sell your business? And how do you think that the pandemic would have affected it if you still owned it then, if you didn't? So the pandemic was one of the best things that happened for our business, actually. Because um, our business was, you want to buy a car online, my software will help you buy that mm. car online. And in America... Dealerships went on lockdown. You couldn't actually go into the dealership. They were considered essential businesses, so they could still operate. But in many states, you weren't legally allowed to go into the dealership. So you have these dealerships that need to sell cars, but you can't go into the dealership to buy them. There's only one way to make that work. You have to buy software online. Uh, you have to buy cars online. Um, and I remember like the first two, three weeks of the pandemic, I got this call on my cell phone and I answered it because whatever. Um, and it's the head of retail for Kia, North America. He's like, hey, we found your company online. We need to put your stuff into our dealerships like immediately. How soon can you be ready? And we're like a pretty small company. And it was like Tuesday. And I was like, we could probably go next week. Like, what can we do? And so next thing I know, Mitsubishi is calling me and all these companies are calling me saying, we need your software in dealerships today or they're going bankrupt. And I was like, okay, like this is actually our moment. We started the company in 2014 probably a little too early for the trend of online car buying, but we were there and we were ready and we just sort of stuck around long enough to get lucky. So pandemic was our lucky moment. We went from probably 18 people at the start of the pandemic to a year and a half later, we were 170, like massive growth. And I remember going to one of our board meetings, showing our hiring plan. And one of our board members was like, interesting. Uh, you are the only company that we have invested in that's not firing people right now. And you wanna like double the team every month. And I was like, yeah, I am I know it's your job to fire me. I'm willing to bet my job that this is our moment. Like we need to step on the gas. And so we grew massively in the pandemic. Um, and it, it, I think it, it wasn't that just that the pandemic was good for us, but it was that we were willing to be the company that's like betting on this. So many times when you're building a business, you will have that chance to bet on yourself. And if you don't take it, it may not come again. And I was like, this is our our one chance. I don't know when there's going to be another massive moment for us. So we we bet everything. So let's talk about the sale. Yeah. You started from nothing in life. You built this business through the roller coaster ride that we just spoke about. And then you sell it for $110 million. Yeah. How does that feel? honestly, most achievements in life, when you achieve them, they only last for a little bit. You, you, you know, get that promotion at work. You have a, you know, meet the dream girl, whatever think you have that high. And then a week later it starts to go down six months later. It's, it's, it's almost like it didn't even happen. You're back to your baseline. So that's what I expected. If I'm being honest, I still have not come down from that high. Like, <laughs> I love that. I, sick, I, I wake up every day and I'm like, this is so 
weird almost that like this is actually my life like literally when i when i talk about selling the company for 110 million dollars it still doesn't feel real so for me it's one of those things where i've achieved so much more than i ever actually truly deep down believed i did all the stuff try to convince myself i'm gonna get it but you don't actually know you're gonna get there to me it's been the the i'll say second greatest thing because my wife's gonna watch, watch this podcast other than meeting my wife, second greatest thing that's Speaking happened. Speaking of, of your wife, and I know we spoke about risk a little bit earlier on. Yeah. You can obviously take more risk in business if you have less responsibilities in your normal life. How do you feel about starting or growing businesses whilst having, you know, girlfriends, wives, maybe not both at the same yep. time, uh, or a family? <laughs> Is that a, thing to, a good thing or a thing that we should avoid if possible? Everyone thinks it's, you know, again, monk mode, all this stuff like, reject girls, like just focus on your business and grow. But actually when you are in that hustle phase of your life, having a girlfriend is like one of the greatest cheat codes because you get to go home and just sort of get nurtured. Like you go home and someone is there for you kind of picking you up. And so what you want is you want the girl that is going to celebrate you with the highest of high moments. And spoiler alert, those girls are really easy to find when everything's going well, when you're the hot, you know, Silicon Valley startup, plenty of girls will hang out with you. And like, so to- you're obviously very tactical yes. uh, with some of the things you've done in terms of when you were talking about which market to infiltrate and stuff like that. Were you tactical about finding the right girl as well? Extremely. I literally built a spreadsheet to find my perfect girl and now my wife. So it had three sections. First, first section is what are all the attributes I want in a future wife? You know, what does she look like? What does she read? How does she feel about travel? All these different things. And I had about 30 items eventually. <laughs> the second list was, what are all the things that I will not settle for? That if she has one of these and it was like 10 things, I'm not going to be able to date her. I doesn't matter if it's one, I'm done. So what were some of those things? Uh, so on the top list, um, one was like she had to be uh, stunning in a cocktail dress or a sweater. (laughs) Like that's just, you know, there are some girls that only look good in the cocktail dress. She has to look great in both. Um, She had to be well-read. She had to be, uh, she had to love travel. Like my wife's been to over 50 countries now. So like, you know, I was just looking for this adventurous, intelligent woman. On the negative side, she couldn't be, um, she couldn't have any major mental uh, health issues because I dated some women who had like, split personality disorder and things like that. And I was like, that can work for some people. It is not compatible with my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I can't be an entrepreneur (laughs) building this business and come home to maybe a different person Mm -hmm. every day. She couldn't have um, a low dream for herself. She had to have a big vision for her life, things like that. Um, And so I I built these two lists, but the third list is the one that really counts, which is, okay, here's your dream girl. She's super hot and she travels the world and she makes a ton of money and blah, blah, blah. What's the guy she's looking for? And that's where reality hits home because you list out maybe the 10, 20 things that she'd be looking for. And then you sit down and you say, how do I stack up against these? And I had to look at it and be like, you know, in some of these areas, I'm like a one out of 10. I'm a little out of shape. Um, I'm not, uh, at the time I was like, she's looking for a generous man. I was like, am I giving enough to charity? Am I being generous with my time, with my money? I wasn't enough. So then you go through and you say, before I get to meet this amazing girl, I need to be a 10 out of 10 in all these categories. Then what you do is when you meet anyone and you start dating them in that honeymoon phase, which is all, you know, flowers and sunshine, you actually, and I pull up, you know, pull up my spreadsheet, plug their name in and rate them on a scale of one to 10 on each of the attributes. And if she's not stacking up to be like a nine out of 10 in every area, I'd actually have to break it off. Would you make the girls that you were dating aware? Hey, look, this is, you know, I'm judging you on these things or is it more of a secret get Tommy. home Plug in the figures. He's pulling the laptop out first date, mate. He's whacking that open, <laughs> running through it. Yeah. No, I... Uh, He's like, yeah, so nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> firstly, yeah. do you... No, not do you have mental health problems? <laughs> can you just now get changed into a jumper just so <laughs> I can see what you look like? Yeah. <laughs> and spin. Mm, okay. No, seven out of 10 there. Uh, no, I, I... The only woman that I actually told about this was my wife because I had run these girls through and they'd be like 18 out of 30... And they have like two things that I don't want. So I was like, nothing is really working. My wife was literally 10 out of 10 in every single category and nothing I didn't want. And I was like, this is, I, she was my fifth date that week. 
So I was I was a busy man. And how, let's say in a, in a course of a month, or how long was this dating spree going on? And how often were you dating? Every week, five a week? Sprints. So. <laughs> <laughs> like we do the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> right, this is my dating week. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. A similar strategy. Yeah, you, you, you have sprints and then you have rest periods. So that was a sprint week for me. Okay. Um, and she was date number five that week. Uh, and I remember when I went on the date with her, I actually just stopped dating entirely. First date, I was like, this woman is so much better than anything else I've found. And it's not emotional. It is my little spreadsheet is telling me like, she's my 10 out of 10 girl. I need to try, take this super seriously. And after that, it was like, I was just committed to her. And I guess we can always almost compare it to arranged marriages in some cases where the, the parents might statist, you know, look at the statistics or, yep. or the mm. facts of the woman before the emotional side gets involved. Yeah, actually one of the most influential things for me on the dating side was uh, Modern Romance by Aziz Ansari, the comedian. It's a really interesting, insightful. I made my wife read it when we were dating. I was like, you need to read this so that like you can be on the same page as me. Uh, he has all these charts that he looked at around arranged marriages relative to, you know, people just meet and like, you know, dating apps and things like that. And arranged marriages not only have lower divorce rates and everything else, but they rank highest on happiness. And the reason for that is arranged marriages don't go in with this like, I let's try this out. Maybe if it doesn't work, we'll split in a couple of years. Like they're committed. And so naturally your relationship will have highs and will have lows, but arranged marriages stick it out. And over time they reach this place where they're really happy. So that was the, the mindset I went into dating when I found this perfect woman. I was like, let's treat it almost like an arranged marriage. Like we're just gonna stick this out no matter what. And we know we will get to a place where like, it's awesome. And we've had highs, we've had lows, but yeah, I'm not super uh, long, but four married, married, like four years married, super happy. Now I find it interesting as well, because like if once you've been together for 20 years or whatever, the relationship ever starts to deteriorate, you can sort of tell yourself like, no, like I know that this is my dream woman because I've already worked it out. So it sort of almost takes that emotion or whatever you may be feeling at the time out of it. And you know what you want. Yeah, that was the other thing I did with my wife, which drove her nuts. She knew probably six months into dating that she wanted to marry me. And I also knew, like I knew I wanted to marry her. Um, but I didn't want to get engaged after six months because I didn't want to give myself the out in 20 years to say, you know what? We, we were young. We kind of rushed into this. Like it was, it was a whirlwind romance and we got married so fast. So it's no wonder it's not working out. Like we just weren't thoughtful with this. So after six months, I said, I'm going to spend the next basically 18 months trying to make sure that this is what I want and looking for any reason why I might be rushing into this or why I don't want to actually marry this woman. And by doing that, by, I mean, two years is not still the longest time, but I was like, when I actually pop the question and get engaged, I have thoroughly convinced myself that I've been like very thoughtful about this decision. So I don't get to go back on it. It's not something that I rushed into. I'm committed to this for life. Yeah. If she was a 10 out of 10 on your spreadsheet and the spark wasn't there, would you still pursue it because the data is telling you this is the girl? Or would you think, well, there's something that this spreadsheet isn't taking into account? I guess you don't get to make it on the spreadsheet unless you're, there's a spark there. But also it's like, you if you actually analyze what you're into, you can find the things that built a spark in you. And, and those were on my list. So by going through this list, evaluating different girls, like there's already a spark there and I'm just making sure she sparks all categories. So it it would be impossible for a girl to be a 10 out of 10 on all my items and for me to not be interested. Like that's just the girl I want. I don't think that there are may, is only maybe one person. I think there may be a, a very select few women in the world that could be like that 10 out of 10 in all categories. But having watched now a lot of my friends get married i will say what most people do is they believe that they're supposed to settle in so many areas so when i when i meet up with them talk about their relationships they will say well it's mostly going great but you know there are these and it's like huge critical flags that they don't want in life but you know he kind of has that and what they say is oh but you know it's so hard to meet someone else it's so hard to like get back into the dating scene and i've watched them now get married and like and i'm like that is just not what you should be settling for. It's it's sort of the same in, in life. Like so many people are just so quick to settle. Mm. And I think relationships are the, one of the areas where people settle the most. You should have an extremely high standard for your relationship because having that standard early on 
makes the rest of the relationship so much easier. If you settle in the beginning, you will constantly be questioning it, constantly be thinking, is this really the best person for me? And the answer is probably no. Say someone's watching this, they're about 25, they've settled. What are you, what's your message to them? Depends on how deep they are and settled. Let's it, say they were, you know, years into a relationship, yeah. but they haven't got married, nothing's happened. Yeah. What should they if do? You, if you're years into a relationship, but you haven't gotten married, you haven't actually committed to that relationship and you just feel it's good, but mm. not outstanding. It's not the world's best relationship. It's not mm. the world's best partner for you. You need to actually cut them off. Like you, you need to break up. You need to end that relationship because there is something better waiting for you. And I believe if you settle in this area, you'll settle in everywhere else in life too. Is your wife entrepreneurial at all? She's not. Uh, and is that something that you look for? I know a lot of entrepreneurs will say that they want a partner who isn't interested in growing something and they're more of a support. And some couples, you know, let's take Alex Hormozzi, for example, is in a relationship where they're both almost running parallel, building something together. How do you see that balancing? I think it would be very hard to be in a relationship with someone who is going through the same extreme emotional highs and lows that you're going through on your journey. If you're an employee, if you're in a regular job, the, the the highs and lows are sort of in this medium range. If you're an entrepreneur, the high is high and low is low. Like it's as extreme as you get. To have two people going through that, I don't know how you make that work. Because you might both be so low that you have nothing to give to the relationship. However, I also don't buy into the model that you want this like maid waiting for you at home that's like cooking the meals, cleaning the house. Like when... When we met, my wife was the rich one. She was the, she's a Silicon Valley engineer, like making most of the money. And I'm like the poor founder making next to nothing. Um, so it's not like I wanted a maid or someone that was just not there. But what I liked is because she's in that middle range, she's not experiencing the lowest lows and the highest highs. She can be a little more stable for me because I'm an unstable person when I'm an entrepreneur. Like I'm going to be in some dark, dark places. And I, I knew I needed someone there that, can just be like, hey, I'm I'm doing okay. So sometimes I'll pour more into you. Some days when you're high, you pour more into me. Mm. So if we could backtrack to selling the business for 110 million, what did that look like? Did the money just drop into your account or yeah, how was the deal structured? Yeah, so um, this has been, you talk about highs and lows. The way we structured the deal was putting to test like the most extreme mental sanity a human can ever go through because it was 15% cash, which is great. Mm. Deal closes, millions of dollars just show up in your bank account. 85% stock. And the stock was locked up for you know a couple of years on out. And so you have it in your brokerage account. You can see all this money and it's daily changing based on the stock price. What I did not know at the time and what I've now learned is the company that we sold it to is the most volatile stock on the NASDAQ. Really? When we did the deal, the stock was around $100 a share. Six months later, it was at four hundred dollars a share, and I was like, "It's static." I couldn't. I I had done the dumbest thing ever, which is I built a live spreadsheet that would use Google to pull the stock price, and then it would calculate how many you know how many oh, shares I no. have, <laughs> would spin it down, and it would show me my net worth after taxes based on the stock price every minute. So if you were to sell that uh, those stocks, that, yeah, that's what you would. This have. would be my net. But it's worth. locked, right? It's locked. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I had to go through this period when I was thirty-two. I could literally log into my brokerage account and watch me lose $40 million in the span of three months. Our stock went from $400 a share to $11 a share. Oh. And at the time, it was one of the most painful things because I had associated my lifestyle with this extra $40 million. We dream, you know, these are the houses we're going to have. These are the jets we're going to buy, blah, blah, blah. When it all came crashing down, I still had a good bit of money, but I felt so broke. I was back to that place where I was begging for soup kitchen food. Like I was so just devastated and I, I felt like I couldn't breathe. And at the time it was extremely painful, but I think it actually ended up becoming one of the best things that happened to me. At least this is what I tell myself when I fall asleep every night with <laughs> less than $40 million than I once had, because it, it put this hole in my life again, where I wasn't just like, you know, sitting on my cloud of money, just chilling, not doing anything. I was like, I need something to, to drive me again. And that's actually how I landed on content on YouTube. I was like, this is now something that I can pursue and give me back that meaning and purpose because I just lost 40 million bucks. And with that, a lot of purpose and meaning went out the window. Would you ever sell those stocks or have you done already? Or would you just get loans off the back of having the stock? Then you don't have to pay all the tax. 
So I tried to get a loan on the stock and I'm so glad no one would give me a loan. Because if I had borrowed $40 million and it crashed, yeah. they, they would take all my money yeah. um, and I'd be bankrupt. So uh, I, I thought about it though, because yeah, if you if you borrow the money, it's tax-free, it's mm. really easy to, way, uh, to make money. But what I've learned uh, by talking to a lot of wealthy people, I joined this club called Tiger 21, thousand members, average net worth is $121 million, like heavy hitters. And what I learned by talking with them is the only way to really go broke once you've made it is through borrowing against your assets. You borrow too much, your assets are volatile, bank comes along, takes all your money. So because of that, I have a rule, I never want to get the margin call. So I don't borrow against any of my stocks. I keep a very, I, right now I have $100,000 in debt because I bought some land like a couple of years ago. <laughs> Other than that, I don't have debt. I don't have margin. Um, I still do have a ton of upstart stock. Uh, it's It's been an interesting year. This year, I think we went from $11 to 72. Today, we're probably at 30. So it's mm -hmm. still like, I'm still on this multi-million dollar roller coaster, um, but I've detached myself from it. I valued it at zero. It's not worth zero. It's obviously still worth a good bit. Um, but by just removing that from my identity, I focus on things that I can control. And when does it unlock? It's fully unlocked now. Are you just so, going to keep it? I'm going to sell it at some point. It's almost because it was once worth more than $40 million. It's almost so painful mm. to sell it because it's like, it, it, it's just, it feels like you're just pissing it in the wind. Like it's just so little relative to what it was um, that I will sell it. But, uh, and I've, I've sold a good bit um, over the years. So I've sort of like moved some out, but um yeah, I, I, I just can't pull the trigger on it because it's just so little relative to what it once was. If you could go back in time and structure that deal differently, would you? Or do you think, yeah, this has worked out the best and now it's created this hole in your life to do other things? Two big mistakes I made when I sold the company. First, I should have pushed for more cash. I, you know, I have friends that sold all cash and it's like, it's not even that you make more by doing stock because you get to ride the up, but it's like, you don't have any emotional roller coaster. The, the roller coaster stops, you get off with your money and like you're set. Just by having the fluctuations of that stock price really took a toll on my mental health. And I wish I would have just pushed more for cash. The second thing I did is when I sold the company, I was in such a honeymoon phase. It's like these people buying my company are literally making all of my life dreams come true. And I am so grateful for them, so loyal. I could work for the next 20 years like I, for them. Like I'm just so happy for this. So all of my team got a two-year earnout, which basically means you get a bonus for selling the company, usually six or seven figures, and you will earn that 50% the first year, 50% the second year. They wanted a three-year earnout for me, and I was so giddy, so happy. I said, "Yeah, let's do it." And the way they structured it was: first year okay, second year okay, both seven figures. Third year was the hammer. It was four million dollars stock plus. Um, equity compensation on top of that, VP salaries. It was like big, big third year. And I was just like, when I signed the deal, I was like, no way. I'm never walking away from that. At the end of it, I actually sort of realized that more money wouldn't change my life. It wouldn't make me happier. I ended up walking away from all $4 million to now lose money every month doing YouTube. And it's like, I have 3,000 subscribers. <laughs> and people probably hearing that are like, you walked away from almost like 4.7, 4.8 million dollars to go be like a part-time YouTuber. Um, but it just got to the point where it's like more money won't make me happy. And I will feel like I am settling in life if I just keep asking myself, what can I do to make more money? People get stuck in this question. It's a valid, valid question, but once you have enough money, things like what makes me happy? What, what can I do to actually impact the world? Those are more meaningful, important questions. And for me, that's now creating content and trying to teach people stuff that you know, fake gurus are trying to lead them astray from. Is that earn out extra on top of what you sold the company for? Or have you actually lost money that would have been into the deal and they structured it in a way that you've lost? Uh, so the first two years, what they do is they actually, what's called unvest your stock. So I owned all my stock in my company and they took it away and said, you will get it back as you earn it out. So that's the first two years. The third year was this massive bonus basically for selling the company. And that was the, yeah, like 4.7, 4.8. So you sold for 110. Yep. If you did that last year, would it technically have been 114 or? It's like part of it. Lost it. So um, whenever you see the numbers from a, an acquisition, there's usually the price of the company and then the price of the earnouts structured in to retain the team. So for us, the price of the company was 100 million. 
the earn out was an additional 10. Okay. And of that 10, four was going to me and I, and I left it. So did your enjoyment change um, when you were kind of working for other people and not owning the company yourself? And is that why you stepped away or was it just because you didn't want or need the 4 million extra? It's definitely both. Uh, I learned some things about myself that I didn't think were true, but because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty humble guy, I don't like the spotlight. I'm not the guy that wants to get on stage and be like, blah, 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 I'm the CEO, everyone follow me. I'm always the guy that would rather just be in the back of the room and let my team talk because they're the superstars. But once I started working in a bigger company, it was about 2,000 people, I would ask you know, someone in HR to do something and they'd be like, oh yeah, like fill out the form and like we'll slot it into our workflow. And like three months later, it's still not done. And this started happening over and over. And I realized I don't like not being the CEO. Because when you're the CEO and like you walk through the office, you drink your coffee, like, oh, the crap, coffee tastes like crap today. Next thing you come in, new coffee beans. Like people just do stuff because they want to please the CEO. When you're this sort of like, I was then a VP at the tech company uh, that acquired us, you're just one of the VPs. And so your complaints get sort of, uh, your requests get put into the sort of the queue and I don't like that. I, <laughs> I I like being like, if I say it, it gets done. Um, and it's, it's, there is probably some ego around that, but it's, it's the way you actually have to build something often is you need someone making decisions. And when you have this sort of like group think eight people are making decisions and weighing in, nothing gets done. And that's what really drove me nuts. It was like, we used to move so fast and make just decisions in 30 minutes and we're executing it the same day. Now it takes weeks and months and that drove me nuts. So there was already this, I'm not enjoying this. And the only thing left here for me is $4 million. And once I realized I didn't need the $4 million, it was obvious for me to walk away. Um, my wife was like, why don't you think about it a little? <laughs> and I was like, no, like I'm doing it. And she's, she's learned if I say I'm going to do something, I do it. And so once I had said that to her, she was like, I basically get 48 hours before you quit your job. And I was like, yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> so were your team shocked at all? Uh, my, you just uh, walked away. Obviously your wife was a little bit, but. Yeah, my team was, you know, one of the things that I wanted to do with the acquisition is I wanted to do right by the acquirers and by my team. Mm. Those are the people that made your dreams happen. So if you just abandon them one day and say, I'm out, like, mm. thanks for the ride, it's been fun. Th thanks for the millions of dollars. You know, you might not talk to those people anymore. You might not see them around, but you will still, I think, feel in your gut that that wasn't the high ground that you went out on. So for me, what I what was really important in the acquisition phase was I wanted to make sure that the acquirer felt they got their money's worth. And so they bought us for 110. I can easily say we've added over a billion dollars of value to their company, like very easily. So I could walk away from that feeling really at ease. On my team side, I just made sure that they were set up for success. And I had one-on-one -on -one conversations with all of my executives saying, I'm leaving. Here's what this means for you. Here's how I've already had conversations to set you up for success. So I like set them up for promotions, set them up for different roles after I was gone. Um, and some have left because a lot of them were loyal to me, but some have stayed and I think are in still really happy positions. Um, and, you know, probably wonder what the hell I'm doing with my life on YouTube, but uh, <laughs> they're happy for me, I think. Yeah, I think it's going to be a, a great journey on YouTube. Hopefully, million subscribers within the, the next year. I don't know what your goal is. What is your goal? My So my big goal right now is I want to hit a million subscribers in the next 12 months. Okay. Um, really throwing a lot of my time into that because like I'm not working. Um, and I think because I am in that small circle of I've done really successful things in business mm -hmm. and now am trying to get really good at content. If I can be that one of that small overlap in that Venn diagram, I think I'll blow up quite fast. And and I also have no job. So I have all this free time to just like study YouTube, make videos. Um, and the one thing is if I hit a million subscribers in the next 12 months, uh, I will buy myself a private jet. Ooh. It's not because uh, I want like this massive private jet to charter me around, but there's this, there's this really cool private jet called a Cirrus Vision Jet, mm -hmm. seat seven. Uh, you fly it. You're not in the back drinking champagne. You're the pilot. Really? And I'd love to be able to just call up my friends and say, hey, uh, I want to go, go take the jet out this weekend. Let's go down to like the Dolomites or let's go to Paris. Mm. Why don't you hop in with me? Because I have a lot of friends that 
for them, that would be an extreme financial stretch. It's hard for me to uh, treat my friends. Like if I said, hey, I'm buying seven first class mm -hmm. tickets. We're all going to the Dolomites. They would feel like so indebted to me and they, I can't take this. But I said, I'm flying my jet to the Dolomites. It's got six empty seats. Can you help me fill it up? Then it feels like you can bring your friends along and do fun things. So uh, why don't you just buy it already? Why wait till a million subscribers? This is what my friend Kunal said. He said, buy it now because you're going to hit the million subscribers. I think I am. I've learned that if I don't have a goal, I'm not I'm a lazy sack of crap. Like if I don't have something that I have on the wall that I'm working towards, I, I'll just be that guy that sits around all day, plays PS5 and watches Netflix. Okay. So by putting that target out there, it's sort of me brainwashing myself to say, I'm going to now work so hard for this. And I'm like 60, 80 hours a week sometimes on YouTube. And I'm not even like working, but it's just like, I just want that goal so bad. So I'm always trying to, when I get close to a goal, set a new goal out and then a reward attached to it. Because you need the goal and the reward because often the goal itself, when you achieve it, doesn't feel very rewarding. It's almost like you've, you've, you've envisioned it so many times that once you achieve it, it's like, ah, I knew I was going to hit it. I was clearly on the path. Um, so you need like some sort of little dopamine hit to trick yourself. So with but you know building on that you sold a company for 110 million how are you spending your money i can see you've got a nice watch on your wrist yeah and right. quickly i just want to say guys make sure to go and subscribe because we yeah. might get a trip on a private jet <laughs> yeah. So. yeah if we hit it i'll definitely take you guys out we'll go awesome. somewhere fun yeah Sounds we're good. free anytime <laughs> <laughs> um so the way i spend my money now uh i i don't actually subscribe much to you know a big fancy luxury lifestyle the AP is really, uh, when I started the company in San Francisco, there was an AP uh, reseller, like a great retailer. And I went in and acted like I was a big shot and tried on the AP because I was like, one day I'm going to do it. So that was sort of like, you know, sold the company. Let me do this. Um, I good, bought a few. Good choice, by the way. Yeah, almost matching. Yeah. Uh, I bought, um, I had a white 911 Porsche on the wall when I was building the company. And in the highest of highs, lowest of lows, I would look at that thing and say like, this is why I'm doing it. So when I sold the company, bought the Porsche 911, 163 grand cash just to like, yeah, it was 0% finance, but I was like, I just want to remind myself like I can do this. Outside of that, uh, we've got a couple homes. So we have a home uh, in London, we have a home in Taipei. We basically now travel the world full time. So we spend about six months a year in Europe. London is our home base. We've got like the YouTube studio there. My wife's got a pottery studio and guest room and all that. And then we've got a home in Taipei, same setup. And and when we're in Taipei, we're traveling out to Asia. So we're going on trips to Japan, to Indonesia, you name it. Um, and those are sort of like our travel hubs. We've got a home in America as well. Um, and we built a lifestyle where we don't have to work. The portfolio generates more than enough income to have multiple homes, travel the world. Uh, and I just focus on spending things. I spend my money based on the decade that I'm in. So if I want to go on a cruise ship to... Norway or whatever. I can do that when I'm 80 years old mm. or 70. Like it's not something I need to do now, but going on it, like I want to race the Nürburgring this year. That's one of my, my uh, goals. I probably don't want to do that when I'm 70 or 80. Yeah. So I'm spending my life in my thirties doing things that I can only do in my thirties. Even this like three homes around the world, traveling kind of full time. That's not something I want to do when we have kids and everything else. So I'm just checking off all the bucket list items. I love how when we started that little conversation there, you said, yeah, I don't really like the luxury life. But then we spoke about first class tickets, <laughs> private jets, watches, Porsches, multiple homes. Yeah, it's, um, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's I mean, the, the amount that we spend relative to what I could spend is like nothing. But I think there's nothing wrong with wanting nice things like living luxury is what a lot of people do it for. I think most people who don't have a lot, if they were to start a business, they're doing it because they want to get rich and live the life that they never had. You came from nothing. You know, you had to ask yeah. for food, soup kitchens. So I think spend it however you like, man. Yeah, I guess the thing I'll say is like, I'm just as happy going to the omakase sushi. That's $600 a head. Me and my wife eat wasabi a lot too. Like we'll go get yeah. sushi for five pounds. And like, it's, it's not that you need to spend the money. It's more like, I don't, I don't like the feeling when I say I can't do it because mm. I can't afford it. That's something I said my whole life. So I don't say that anymore. I just say, I just want to do this. I'm going to do it. And if yeah. I don't want to do it, I don't, I don't do it because I need to like fill some hole in my life anymore. I just want to do it because I want to do it. Yeah, I fuck with that. Yeah.
Yeah, you're not trying to impress others. You're just doing it because you want to do it. Yeah. And that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast. It's been great. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. If you guys enjoyed, make sure to smash that thumbs up button for the YouTube algorithm. And we will see you next Wednesday with a brand new podcast. So it's goodbye from me. And, and it's, it's goodbye, goodbye from, from these guys. These guys. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with that one. Thank you, bro. That was a pleasure.